Hey, everybody, it's great to see you here uh, this evening, uh, afternoon for some of you, for um, one of our amazing events today we are talking about today, Solitary But Not Alone, From Incarceration to Abolition, a conversation around Albert Wood Fox's landmark work, Solitary. And this evening, afternoon, he will be in conversation with Alice Kim and Margaret Power, who will be receiving formal introductions in just one minute. But first, we want to let you know that this event is being co-sponsored by Scholars for Social Justice and our partner for this project, Historians for Democracy and Peace. So real briefly, we're going to have Margaret Power come on the line and tell us a bit about the organization Historians for Peace and Democracy. Hi, everybody. Thanks to Varian. Actually, it's historians for, oh, uh, historians for Peace and Democracy, but it's the same thing, so that's fine. Um, we're a national organization of historians, and we use the term historians pretty loosely in that we're not exclusive, we're inclusive. So if you are a historically minded person, you are welcome. We started um, actually way back in 2003 to oppose the US, imminent US invasion of Iraq. And then uh, we started the historians against, we changed to historians for peace and democracy in 2016 after Trump was elected because we wanted to focus both on international policy and US policy with which we think as see that are totally interrelated. And um, right now we're working on the, in opposition to the attacks that have been unleashed in this country <laughs> at an everly increasing scale against the teaching of accurate, true history and against teachers and against texts and against articles and books that tell the truth about, about our past, the truth that we find it so critical to, to learn and to understand and they're particularly directed against the history of black people, of enslavery and the LGBT people. So that's who we are. So great to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Margaret, for being with us um, and for offering this wonderful co-sponsorship for this really important project. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about the organization that you're co-sponsoring with, um, with HPAD is SSJ, Scholars for Social Justice. Um, SSJ was founded to create space for radical and progressive scholars to engage, agitate, and organize outside of the formal and often stifling context of the academy. Our main goal as an organization is to be able to, to sit in collaboration with and in service to racial and social justice movements. We are deeply committed to the ongoing struggle against white supremacy and white nationalism and their blatant and insidious forms, which is why the leadership and founding of SSJ were scholars, primarily women scholars of color. So, uh, and particularly black women. So that black and brown agency and leadership did not become an afterthought. We realize there are rich reservoirs of knowledge also outside the academy. So we welcome unaffiliated and independent scholars, researchers and educators into our ranks. We also realize that the university is not just faculty and therefore we are eager to work with students, campus workers and those in the communities adjacent to our campuses. Our first project a few years ago was a national working group on reparations in higher education. And our current focus is on campus abolition and reparations projects led by members and friends of SSJ, both on campus and off. We currently are operating under the rubric ARIS, abolition, reparations, investment in dispossessed communities and safety. And as a testament to this ARIS project that we've launched this year, we are I'm so happy to co-sponsor this event um, on solitary with historians for peace and democracy. And this particular event gives us also the opportunity to um, announce it as being first in a new series that SSJ is launching, the Leith Mullings Social Justice Salon. After a summer break, the salon will continue in fall of 2022 and feature authors, organizers, and artists to discuss transformative scholarship, activism, and creative work in the realm of social justice. The salon aims to feature work that follows Leith's honest, imaginative, and bold example, and to promote a conception of scholarship that amplifies the many mediums of study 
through which knowledge is produced. As a testament to that, on September 22nd, get your calendars out, mark it down. September 22nd, we will host a conversation with Dylan Rodriguez discussing his book, White Reconstruction, Domestic Warfare and the Logics of Genocide. And then almost a month later on October 13th, we will be joined by Erica Edwards where she will discuss her new book, The Other Side of Terror, Black Women and the Culture of US Empire. Both events will be virtual at 6.30 Eastern, 5.30 Central. And we look forward to sending more info about other conversations in this Leaf Mulling Seminar. See Salon, excuse Salon. And as a testament to that, we will have one of our co-founders of SSJ, Barbara Ransby, come on to help frame the importance and the significance of Leaf Mullings and why we are honored to create the salon in her name, Barbara. Thank you so much, um, Tavarian. This is, um, I'm really glad to see this happening and how wonderful that we have our brother, Albert um, Woodfox with us for this inaugural Leaf Mullings Salon. Uh, I'm gonna be brief and I wanna start with a message from uh, Professor Donna Ayn Davis, who is herself a distinguished writer, scholar, anthropologist, uh, but was also a close comrade and friend um, of, of our beloved Leaf Mullings. Um, I'll share with you Donna's words, and then I just want to selfishly offer um, some words of my own um, in, in terms of setting the stage for this salon and why naming it after Leaf Mullings is so important to us. So these are Donna's words. Distinguished Professor Leaf Mullings was a great scholar, activist, and public intellectual who died unexpectedly in December of 2020. She was a beloved member of the Graduate Center Anthropology Program, a talented advisor and teacher and a generous colleague. Prior to her retirement in 2016, she had served on the faculty for some 35 years and had developed many enduring friendships. In 2015, Leith was among the 32 scholars named uh, as a part of the inaugural Andrew Carnegie Fellowship. She served as president of the American Anthropological Association from 2011 to 2013, which is no small accomplishment. She was also recipient of the Society for Anthropology of North American Prize for Distinguished Achievement in Critical Study of North America and of the French American Foundation Prize uh, and Chair in Civilization. Professionally known for her cutting edge ethnographic work, Leaf work, Leith was deeply committed to the application of feminist, anti-racist, and social justice, as well as internationalist perspectives in her scholarship. During her long and illustrious career, she did field work uh, in the continents of Africa, Latin America, throughout the Caribbean, and in the United States. She is lauded for her theoretical contribution of the Sojourner Syndrome, a framework for examining severe health disparities as the articulation of power at the nexus of race, class, and gender. But one of the things that was most important to Leith was her insistence on integrating activism for social transformation with scholarship. In tribute to her life and scholarly commitments, uh, the, there has been the establishment of the Leith Mullings Memorial Lectureship at the CUNY Graduate Center. The memorial is established by a generous grant from the ADCO Foundation on whose board Mulling served for many years. And we will have something on our website uh, that will allow people to make a contribution uh, if you're so inclined. Part two of Donna's message is this. She wanted to also um, not only share a, a formal statement about Leith's accomplishments and career, but also a personal note. And this is her note to Leith, and I'm quoting her. Leith, I have a signed copy of the presidential address for the 113th meeting of the American Anthropological Association that you gave me. The title of that brilliant address you gave is Anthropology Matters. I see it every time I sit at my desk and in the upper right-hand corner is your beautiful writing. Your message reads to Donna Ayn with love, Leith. What that means is that every day I think of you and I'm reminded that the work we produce as scholars must matter. I still miss you and I'm quite happy. I told you on so many occasions how much I adore you. Your wise counsel carried me through many challenges and your contributions to the anthropological community 
uh, continue to reverberate in the scholarship and commitments of those you trained and those you walked with. What you gave us was a vision and a purpose. Uh, that is, you know, very touching words by Donna. And, and let me just offer a few words of my own about my dear sister and colleague um, and comrade Leaf. I knew Leaf Mullins' name before I knew the person. When I moved to Chicago in the early 1990s, there was this thing called the Communiversity. Uh, it was a space that had been created in community by radical Black activists uh, to share ideas and debate issues with people in Chicago community. It was an activist project through and through. We revived that, uh, some of us uh, here in Chicago, Leith had already left, um, but her name kept coming up as someone who had pioneered that early community. I began to know her and, and befriend her in the mid 1990s when we began discussions with Bill Fletcher, Manny Marable, Abdullah Kali Mott uh, about the Black Radical Congress which was launched in Chicago in 1998. And Leith and I were uh, the, the only two women and two of the, the five founding members of uh, the BRC and really pushed very hard within that context for a Black Feminist Caucus. We later worked together in African-American Women in Defense of Ourselves, uh, and most recently in the Rising Majority, which is a multiracial coalition founded by the Movement for Black Lives. In that context, Leif and I were the elders, or as we like to think of ourselves, the yeldas, the young elders. Um, people would look around and say, so what happened you know, back in whatever decade you know, seemed uh, uh, old at the time? Um, and Leif and I would look at each other and, and offer some you know, memory that we could conjure up. But I remember very fondly both the sisterhood and the, um, sharing of thoughts and hopes and aspirations for that work and the, and the collegiality as well as comradeship. Leith also worked with Sister Scholar Network and of course with social, uh, Scholars for Social Justice on which she was a part of the leadership team. Leith died on Ella Baker's birthday, which was also the day that Ella Baker died, December 13th. I will always remember that day. I will always cherish all of the lessons and teachings of my dear sister and her example of toughness, selflessness, no nonsense, staunchly on the side of the oppressed, staunchly on the side uh, of freedom and justice. She loved our people. She loved our movement with all of its flaws and blemishes. And she loved her family. And I hope uh, some of them are listening this evening, her sisters and siblings and stepchildren and uh, very significantly Aaliyah and Michael Tyner uh, and Lilia, her uh, two children and her beloved granddaughter who she showed me many, many pictures of. Um, I hope they know um, that we loved her too and then we will always keep her memory alive. So we, you know, with that, we launched the Leaf Mullings Book Salon. We will have lively uh, discussions and we will invoke her incisive wit um, and, and, and curiosity and brilliance uh, in, in, in every way that we can uh, as a tribute to her memory. Thank you so much, Barbara, for those words um, of remembrance and respect. And, and we must acknowledge that Leaf was a giant and her impact is significant, both big and small. And, and, it, and let this moment be a, a testimony to, to remember to, to give flowers to those around you that you respect and admire, your comrades, your friends, your family, bear them up, acknowledge them. Because we know the work that we do here is not always acknowledged, it's many times attacked. And so in these spaces, turn towards each other and love one another and be there for one another and look across the aisle and, and reach out and acknowledge what people have done in your life, both big and small, that might not mean something to you, but can mean everything to them. And so in this moment, take this and carry it with you that we give the flowers today and every day to those who we know, those we don't know, that help build out this community, this, this, this vision, this beloved community that, that we're trying to build in the face of fascism and terror and horror. We All we got is each other. We turn to each other, we build each other, and we bear each other with scars, messiness, and all. Be there for each other to help us grow and develop as a community of struggle of resilience, of repair, of something better than what we currently have. 
and, and, and in this moment, let's let's be that. Let's let's invoke that. Let, let's embody that in the name of Leaf and, and so many others. There are giants in this room tonight. They are in the air. They are on the Zoom. There's Leaf and in the room. I can feel her. Barbara is here as a giant. Albert Wilfox is here to speak to us and give us knowledge. Let's connect these dots and preserve this chain of resilience and legacy. And so with that being said, I want to introduce the conversationalist for this, for this evening, afternoon, as we honor and respect and take conversation in this first Leith Mulling Social Justice Salon in conversation with our dear brother and comrade and, and mentor, Albert Woodfox. In the name of solitary, but not alone, from incarceration to abolition, a conversation around Albert Woodfox's landmark work, Solitary. In conversation with Brother Albert this evening, this afternoon, will be Alice Kim, who is Director of Human Rights Practice at the Posen Family Center for Human Rights at the University of Chicago. She co-directs a justice policy and culture think tank and teaches at Statesville Maximum Security Prison with the Prison and Neighborhood Arts Education Project, and is co-editor of The Long Term, Resisting Life Sentences, Working Toward Freedom with Haymarket Books. Joining her in conversation with Brother Albert will be Margaret Power, co-chair of Historians for Peace and Democracy and professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology. She recently co-authored the book, Hope in Hard Times, Norvelt and the Struggle for Community During the Great Depression, and is completing a new project, Solidarity Across the Americas, the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party versus U.S. colonialism. So please um, allow Margaret to offer the penultimate introduction of Brother Albert Woodfox. Thank you. I will be brief because I know you want to hear Albert. But since we're speaking of birthdays, I also want to point out today is both the birthday of Ho Chi Minh and Malcolm X. So I think there is a lot to celebrate. And um, Albert's book, which I have here backwards, but there it is. In case you don't have it, be sure to get it. I'm sure after you hear Al Albert tonight, you will want to get it. It was the finalist for both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award in 2019. The book is so much. It's both a story of Albert growing up in New Orleans under very difficult conditions. It's an insider and very personal story of the US um, judiciary system and also of the carceral state. It's also a testament to the power of collective action. And most of all, I feel that it demonstrates your Albert, Albert's immense humanity, your solidarity and your commitment to social justice. And to me, it's, it's incredibly inspiration. And despite everything you went through it's also a testament to hope and why we can never give up hope and why we always have to keep struggling. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Albert. And as the variant said, we're having this as a conversation. So I'm gonna begin the first question. Finally, you're getting to talk Albert and finally everybody's getting to hear you. Could you give us a sense of your years in prison and um, your, sort of your arc? from being incarcerated to understanding yourself and defining yourself as a political prisoner? Uh, well, thank you for having me. I'm so honored to be amongst everyone on the panel. Um, you know, uh, for me, you know, uh, I always use the term of uh, raising my level of consciousness. Uh, through education, re-education, and, you know, growth. Uh, when I was, you know, uh, sentenced to 50 years, uh, you know, at the time I was a petty criminal knucklehead. I had no political awareness, no experience. And eventually, you know, I had a peripheral uh, knowledge of the Black Panther Party. You know, the party had exploded on, on American society in the 60s and, uh, but, uh, you know, I escaped and eventually wound up in Harlem, New York. And so I had an opportunity to meet some of the Panthers. And I'm not gonna lie, it was, it was mostly the sisters, you know, as I say, I was still a, a, a knucklehead. 
And, you know, but these, these sisters were, was talking about revolution and community involvement and, 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 and self-defense and stuff, you know, and I, I was totally lost, you know, I mean, uh, eventually over the years of education and self-education, I grew and developed enough wisdom to where I could define the kind of person, uh, the kind of human being I wanted to be, the kind of man I wanted to be. And uh, since that time, it took me about 20 years to undo what the system had done to me. And uh, uh, I became an avaricious reader, uh, uh, especially on uh, the African-American and African history. And, uh, you know, uh, so that was a process, you know. Uh, uh, in between all of that was gassing and beatings and demonstrations and hunger strikes for, you know, just human, uh, be treated as human beings, uh, uh, you know, and uh, unfortunately it took 44 years and 10 months for me and, I, and, and the power of the people to, to, to win my physical freedom, you know. But I had, in my own uh, uh, mind, I had obtained freedom uh, when I was in my early 40s, when I had, you know, I was able to define what kind of person I wanted to be. I was able to define, you know, moral principles, values, the code of conduct that I wanted to live my life by, rather than those that had been enforced upon me by uh, a racist society. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's part of, you know, the human being that's setting uh, before you now, you know, the process it took to get there with uh, the book, uh, you know, uh, you know, Robert and, and Harmon and now, unfortunately, as you know, we, the Harmon is no longer with us. Uh, we, he, but he died a free man and he, he, he lived for three days after winning his freedom, but he died a free man and he was aware that he was free. So that was a tremendous uh, burden of all of our lives uh, and, uh, and, you know, but we used to always, uh, at, at once, at, at the, in the beginning, it was kind of like anger with society for allowing solitary and the horrors of solitary. Uh, and then at some point, as our level of conscience raised, we began to oh, uh, realize that Society didn't know what was solitary was. They didn't know anything about society. I mean, so, uh, solitary. They didn't know the horrors that was being inflicted upon uh, men, women, and, and and children in the prison system in the name in their names. You know, because bureaucrats and elected officials are always quick to say, "Well, in the name of the people," you know. But and so uh, that inspired. It both, you know, Robert uh, authored the book, uh, Fold Solitary, uh, he called from the bottom of the heap, you know, and what he, he talks about his experiences in this country and what led to him, you know, uh, uh, being in prison. And so, it is, as I say, it was a process. And in that, the thing about it, though, for me, is like right now, I'm meeting some very great people. Uh, I'm, Re-establishing contact with some great men and women, uh, and that's what inspires me and gives me hope uh, to keep uh, being a social activist uh, in this world. Thank you very much. I'll jump in here. First, I just want to say I'm so grateful to be sharing space with you, Albert. Um, it's great to see you here on, on Zoom and to be in conversation with you and Margaret. Um, and I'm, I reread your memoir um, leading up to this, and I'm so moved by your memoir and so moved by your words. Um, really words to live by. You talk about overcoming fear. You talk about um, turning fear into compassion. And really those are words to live by, I think, that all of us can, can use to live by. And I, I wanna take us back to um, the beginning of your book. 
um, where you talk about developing a toughness, um, just being out in the streets, how you had to develop this tough exterior. And that later when you um, went to Angola, um, that toughness served you and you had to even further, further develop it, um, but that it wasn't in your nature. And I'm wondering if you can, if you can talk about that um, to, to help us understand what it is that, that you went through. And I think we still um, see, that, see that kind of toughness, right, um, uh, among folks today. So if you can talk a little bit about, um, about that. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, my generation was from the 60s, you know, and uh, a lot of time, you know, I have to hold my breath or look away when I hear people talk about how hard it is now. And, you know, I mean, it, don't get me wrong, it, you know, it's not to, uh, uh, you know, downplay what the racism in this country, but, you know, I come up in, I come up in an area where racism was, was brutal in your face and there was no, I mean, racism now wears a suit and a tie, you know, and we use coded words, uh, but in my era, you know, the racism was brutal in your face and you know uh, uh, the, that uh, my community was constantly being terrorized and stuff by two men in a in a in a, in a car with a, a light on top of it, you know, and had absolutely power and control over over everyone in the community, you know, and 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 and, and, and you know when you have that kind of unchecked power, you know, then you are out, you are able to play out. Uh, your own personal agenda, and, and unfortunately, uh, there of course these cops' personal agenda was racism, you know, the individual racism, you know, uh, that was supported by institutional racism, you know, and uh, so in order to survive, you had to not only that, but you know, in the African American community, you 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 have to develop certain mechanism of survival. And you know, not not allowing uh, acts or uh, events or whatever of, of great great pain and suffering or disappointment, uh, you have to develop a toughness, you know, to not allow it to overwhelm you. And and unfortunately, a lot of you know people in my community wouldn't didn't couldn't develop that toughness. And I, I watched them succumb to it, you know, and, and at the time, I mean, I didn't have the level of consciousness or the awareness that I have now. A lot of my, my wisdom is hindsight because I can go back in my history and understand what broke these people, what caused them to do some of the things they did, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, up until I developed that ability you know, I, like most people, I always blame the individual for their actions rather than the society and, and institutions that cause or create conditions and people are responding to that, you know. Uh, but my toughness really came from my mom. I didn't know it at the time, you know, but, you know, she set an example of toughness, you know. Uh, my mom, unfortunately, what society did to her, she was fortunate, uh, uh, she was uh, functionally uh, illiterate. She could only read and write her name. But I never saw my mom break. I never saw her succumb to the oppression and the racism, whether it was institutional or individual. She always found a way to survive, you know? And, uh, you know, so my toughness came from my mom, the example she set. And, you know, and, and it served me well, even to this day, that toughness that she instilled in me that, you know, I didn't understand at the time. I thought she was trying to control my life, you know, like that most teenagers do when they get reach a certain age and they start to rebel against their parents and stuff, you know. And uh, people who they've loved and trusted their whole life all of a sudden become, you know, uh, this uh, oppressive force in their life and stuff. You know, I guess it's a, a rite of passage, you know, but, uh, but you know, I, I am, you know, happy to say that 
uh, I became the human being I am now, the man I am, and I was able to sit down and look across at my mother and thank her for all she had done for me. All, you know, and you know, it was so crazy because when I was, you know, when I joined the party, which was the, you know, the foundation for everything I, I am now. And one of the requirements was, was reading. And, you know, it was so strange because I was reading, I'd be reading books on history and stuff. And I kept saying, I didn't heard this before. Uh, you know, why do I have a feel of kinship to what's being said here? You know, and eventually I developed enough awareness, like my mom used to say this, my mom used to do this, you know? And so, you know, I can't even begin to think you know, uh, my mom for, you know, everything I am, you know, she is the foundation, especially the toughness, you know, and, you know, we, we, you know, in my, in my era, you know, I, I, I often wonder who some of the people, you know, today in social struggle, do they know what it is to eat a sugar sandwich, you know, uh, you know, to keep from being hungry and stuff, you know what I mean? Uh, and 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 my mom made me feel like I was eating uh, uh, some kind of uh, fancy meal, you know. Uh, I mean, that was the kind of woman she was. That was the kind of personality uh, she had, you know. And uh, so that's that's where that toughness comes from, you know. Surviving, surviving, surviving. You know, uh, survival is hope because you feel as though if I can just get to the next day and this will change, you know? And that that hope, that toughness, you know, I, uh, for, you know, I, I was locked in a solitary confinement for 44 years and 10 months. And I was in a nine by, you know, a six by 12 cell, but the space available was much smaller than that because of, you know, you got bunks attached to the wall and, Commode and stuff attached to, to the back of the cell stuff. So you have a very narrow uh, space, you know. And uh, throughout all the claustrophobic attacks and 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 and, and the anger and the bitterness, uh, I can honestly say I never ever lost hope. And hope is toughness, you know. When you allow, don't allow whatever's going on in that particular moment to break you. So that's, that's how, I, you know, that's where my toughness comes from. It started with my mom and uh, until, you know, I, I always tell people I grew into my mother's wisdom and strength, you know? And so that sustained me until I, you know, was able to define, I was around, I think I was around 42 somewhere when I had accumulated enough wisdom and enough uh, uh, knowledge and education where I was say, okay, you have to define who you are. For all this time you've been to society and the institutions and whatever have defined what kind of person you are. Now it's time for you to define who you are. And, you know, uh, and I was able to do that. And I think for me, that moment was when I became free. I wasn't free physically, but I was free mentally, emotionally, philosophically, you know, because I was began to understand and see, uh, as they say, not just see black or white, but see the gray in between. Uh, and, you know, and, and pretty much that, that was in, in my world. You know. Thanks so much for that, um, Albert. Um, you, you talk about toughness as a survival strategy. Um, you also have this really moving, well, the whole book is really in some ways about your journey of learning and unlearning, right? And there's a really moving passage in your book about how you transformed yourself. Um, you said, by the time I was 40, I saw that I had transformed my cell, which was supposed to be a confined space of destruction and punishment into something positive. Um, that you use the space to educate yourself, you know, build your character, to develop your principles and a code of conduct. Can you talk about that process of self-education inside? Well, you know, sales 
The cells were meant to really actually, they were meant to be debt chains, you know. Uh, the, uh, the prison system and the state of Louisiana actually, when they put us in that cell, it, they expected us to die there. Uh, they expected us to become institutionalized and renounce what we believed in, embrace prison culture and all the other destructive uh, aspects of prison culture. And, you know, but unfortunately, we uh, rather fortunate we had uh, developed a political awareness to a point where we knew that if we were going to survive solitary, then we had to turn outward. We had to let influences in our lives be what was going on in our, in first in our families and then in society, uh, and, and not turn inward and be institutionalized and embrace prison culture and get caught up in all the madness that, that you know, prisons are, uh, can in, inflict upon on, on its population. And uh, so, uh, you know, that, that played a, a major part, you know. Uh, and, and like I say, unfortunately, the Panthers Party had given me enough awareness and Robert and Harmon enough awareness to that we knew what we was dealing. That's why knowledge is such a great weapon. You know, when you know what you are part of or you're exposed to a, a power that's working to destroy you, you know, you have a powerful weapon because you know how to fight back. And so that's, that's you know, everything that those cells became a high school, university, law clinic, uh, debate hall, you know, everything that those cells were not designed to be, that's what we've turned them into. And that helped us, you know, it should, certainly it helped me to define, you know, I guess, uh, character, you know, character is everything that, that I am, you know, my moral principles, my values, my dignity, pride, self-respect, you know, uh, and so I think even to this day, I think the thing that, you know, we didn't just survive solitary, we prospered as human beings, we became, we went from being petty criminals to being social activists and revolutionaries. And we developed a high standard of moral principles and values and code of conduct. And we made a solemn vow that this is how we would live no matter what the consequences would be. And over the decade, the consequences were brutal and many, you know, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, someone asked me, uh, uh, you know, what I'm, what, you know, what am I, what am I most proud of, you know, now that I'm free and I'm like, I'm still standing, you know, they didn't break me. I'm still standing. You know? So, you know, that's was part of me, uh, that transformation I talk about in my book from, you know, petty criminal to a social activist revolutionary, uh, you know, and, but it all, again, it, you know, I, it all started with my mom, you know. Okay, thanks. Um, earlier, you mentioned that most people, you thought at the time, most people just simply weren't aware of what solitary confinement is like. I think we can say that's probably still true today just as I think there's so many people really aren't aware of what prisons are like. And I think there's also this non-level, this non-recognition of the fact that there are political prisoners in the United, in US jails. So I was curious um, what you think, first of all, how you think you transformed that so that people did become aware of solitary, which is what you did. And in doing so, you helped to build a movement that was, of people who were interested in opposing solitary confinement and getting you out of jail. That's one part of the question. The other part of, of the question is, what do you think the relationship between the progressive movement or the left movement in this country should be and the struggle of the imprisoned in terms of, um, uh, in terms of the imprisoned, in terms of political prisoners and in terms of prisoners? Because often I feel in this country, there's, they're not that connected. Whereas in other countries, they're very connected. Not in this country, though. Well, to begin with, uh, 
I'm sitting here having this conversation because of people like yourself and Alice and what we call the International Coalition of Free the Angle of Tree. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people who are law and dedicated and, and, and you know, believe that uh, never lost hope that what they were doing. Then. But on a personal level, to have so many people, when we went from being local to national to international, to be worthy of that, to be worthy of that trust, to be worthy, you know, to carry myself in a certain way or for us to carry ourselves in certain ways and to uphold certain principles and values. It was, a, it, it was, and it still is a tremendous burden. You know, I know that people mm. look at me a certain way and I, I welcome that, you know, because it, it to me it is a motivating force in my life. It is, it, you know, it, it, it challenges me every day when I, when I wake up, you know, uh, even when I just hang around the house, my mind is constantly, you know, I'm a, con I'm, 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 I'm a news junkie. I watch a lot of documents and, and documentaries and stuff, you know, and I'm constantly learning and I'm constantly growing. And, you know, and I think it had, had to do with some of, the, some of the stuff, the books I've read over, over, over the decades and stuff, uh, you know, to realize that I can't allow, particularly my mind to stagnate, you know, the way, get to the point where I feel I've done enough or I've contributed enough. And so, you know, uh, that, you know, I no longer, you know, need to learn, you know? And so I'm learning something every day. Uh, I'm, my mind is constantly being challenged by what's going on or, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are so many questions that, you know, I don't have so, so answers for, but just trying to find the answers uh, to make sense of, of this, you know, uh, seems to, to serve me well, you know, because it forces me again, like I say, to grow a little bit. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's what it is. As far as social struggle in this country right now, uh, I still think there's a conversation we have, we need to have in this country. And, uh, amongst revolutionary forces in this country or social activists or whatever term you want to use. And I still think that we are tiptoeing around certain things mm -hmm. and we have to have these conversations, you know, uh, uh, you know, everybody blaming Donald Trump for the white supremacy in this country, but what they have done, Donald Trump did not put white supremacy in this country. <laughs> He gave it a suit and a tie. He made it okay to expand hatred and bigotry and stuff, you know, and, and, and sexism. And, and, and you know, uh, he made people believe that, well, you don't have to play by the rules, you know, by any means necessary, as long as you, you accomplish whatever it is, you know. And uh, so, you know, uh, it's difficult, you know, trying to hold on to who you are, what you believe in, continue to struggle. And, uh, you know, I mean, right now, you know, in my, my personal opinion, we're living in a police state, mm -hmm. you know, and the police is so out of hand right now. But I think that as, 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 as a force in this country, the social activists, the revolutionaries, I think that we do great in analyzing things and, but I think we do a poor me in messaging. I think we allow the, the, the white supremacist elements in this country to take away the message. And as a result of that, that makes our, our efforts and our struggles uh, longer. And so instead of moving forward, at times we move in, we moving around and around in circles, you know, because we allow someone else to take our ideas, our belief, our moral principles and stuff and define them. And until we, we have that conversation, and until we do a better job of presenting what we believe in and the, the values and the whatever to society and to the world, uh, 
the, the, it's going to take longer for us, you know, to, to build a better society based upon what's best for humanity rather than what's best for somebody's bank account. You know? <laughs> Thank you. You know, you talk about the international movement that developed um, for the Angola Three to support the Angola Three. I'm wondering if you, and in, the, in your book, you talk about and you describe how everything changed when you met, I think it was Scott Fleming, who was a volunteer for critical resistance, right? Yeah. And then there was, um, then suddenly, right, you started receiving an outpouring of support and letters. Can you talk about the significance of that kind of support from the outside and that kind of inside outside organizing that you um, and Herman, Herman and Robert did with um, the movement? Well, you know, uh, it started out at the angle of two self-defense committee. And at some point we said, wait a minute, Robert is going through the same thing. He's suffering the same uh, thing, the brutality, uh, the hunger strikes, the gassing, the beatings, the being put in the dungeon. So, you know, we have to, you know, embrace him. We have to bring him into this, you know, but it started with, you know, uh, people, uh, ex-Panthers, uh, you know, uh, uh, getting, you know, keeping our issues before the public until the level of conscience of the public caught up and the more exposure we got, you know, and Scott Fleming, had it not, he preserved the issues that eventually led to my freedom in the court system, you know. My case was overturned three different times and appellate court reverse that ruling, you know? And the last issue was grand jury farmer discrimination. But all of those issues that my case was overturned was as a result of the work of, of Scott Fleming, who was at the time was a, a law student. He wasn't even a member of the bar, you know? But Scott is, you know, there are so many people that cause, you know, us, us all three of us not to die in, in those cells that the state of Louisiana and the Department of Correction intended it, you know, until, uh, you know, uh, I think a, a major, a major turning point was meeting, uh, was Anita Roddick finding out about our case. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, Anita Roddick was the founder and, and, and owner of the uh, beauty shop, her and her family. And so when she, you know, all of the hard work of the core, we, we refer to them as the core members of the coalition who kept our case alive, kept what we were going through, our struggles before the people uh, who made the trips, who went to the churches and the uh, community centers and, 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 you know, to make people know there are three men who, you know, are struggling for humanity. They're struggling just to be human, you know? And, uh, uh, and so, you know, by them doing that, then more and more people be learn about A3. And that's why it's so important to have outside support. Uh, you know, we, we reuse the term support uh, committees, you know, because these are the people who sacrifice so much. These are the people who, uh, you know, after one setback after another, never lose hope, believe in them. And, 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 and in, a, in a way, as I said earlier, that helped me become a better human being because how could I betray the trust that these people put in me? You know, that what they, they, were, they were struggling to free me because they believe I had transformed into something worthy. I have become a decent human being, you know? Nothing extraordinary, just a decent human being. And so that helped me, you know, uh, tremendously, uh, you know, in times, you know, uh, like our, you know, uh, not to get too particular, but, you know, we had, to, we had to, uh, a 45 day hunger strike just to make them feed us in a humane way. It was putting our food on the floor, sliding it under the door, you know? 
And we ate like that for a, one time, a long time, but then at some point your level of consciousness is raised until you realize that this kind of treatment is no longer acceptable. And so we didn't eat for 45 days to force them to agree to cut uh, slots in the cell to put the trays through. Right. And after they agreed to that, we had to eat through the bars for 18 months before they decide to come cut the slots. You know, we had to stand at the bar and hold our trays because we wouldn't slide our trays under the door. And that was part of the agreement. So we would stand at the bars and hold our trays in one hand and eat through the bars, you know, as best we could, uh, you know. And of course, we didn't know it would be 18 months later, but that's how long it took. You know, but those are kind of things that, you know, I hope, you know, one of the most effective tools in prison is a hunger strike, but it is brutal. You know, when, you're, when you can feel your body feeding upon itself, when you can see first fat and then your muscles begin to, you know, disintegrate because your body is not getting nourishment, so it starts to feed upon itself. You know, but there were so many times when I wanted to eat, when I wanted to pull that tray under the door. But then I, I would always think about the men and women and children in society who were marching, who were sacrificing, you know, uh, making so many sacrifices because they believed in me. They believed in what I was doing, you know, that made me say no. I'll, I'll drop dead in this cell before I eat off one of those trays unless it comes to a food slot, you know? So yeah. that's the importance of people who are uh, involved in social uh, uh, support committees with political prisoners, you know? Uh, it, it gives them strength, you know, and it gives them a focus point to where they, they are willing, uh, at least for me, where, you know, like, as I said, I. I, 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 before I would have allowed those people to break me, I would have made them kill me. Mm. That's, that was the state of mind I, I had then. And, and I have not, you know, I'm not gonna be deterred from being a social activist or revolutionary uh, until the ancestors called me home. Mm. You know, they say, all right, we need somebody to sit on the council, time to come home. You know, I will be a social activist, social revolutionary. Uh, in this country, in this world. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing that really powerful example of self-determination and organizing on the inside. Um, you know, Barbara Ransby is reminding us in the chat about another example of organizing on the inside. Um, uh, she said that looking at your t-shirt, she's reminded of this, um, okay. how you had co-founded um, a committee, an anti-rape committee um, while you were in prison um, and that you and other Panthers uh, decided that this wasn't gonna happen on your watch. Can you talk about um, organizing that, how it came about um, and why it was so important? Well, you know, uh, Harmon and I uh, established the only recognized chapter of the Black Panther Party in the prison system. And uh, as a part of the, you know, the party, the principles of the party. Uh, but what, what, it, what caused me to st start this anti-rape? Yeah, I was sitting on my bed and I had this young kid uh, across from me. And the most horrible thing in the world is to see a, a person who has been broken. When you break a person's spirit, it's almost impossible for them to come back from, from that. You know, it's possible, but more people don't come back from it than do. And I've seen this little kid, he was about 17, 18 years old. He was sitting in a bunk and he just was broke, you know. And so I just went over to the bed and I sat down and I said, what's going on, little man, you know? And he said, I'm all right, I'm all right. You know, I said, come on, you can talk to me. You know? And he told me he had been raped. Had some guys, you know, tricked him in the area and about three or four of them jumped him and 
and raped me, you know, and I'm like, I mean, I knew this was going on in the prison, but it it was like my level of conscience had not been raised to the point where I was outraged by this. And I felt as though I had to do something about it until this young kid, you know, seeing him broken. I, you know, I hope no human being ever have to experience what it is to, to see another human being who has been broken. You know, it does something to you. Uh, it did something to me inside. And so the next day, uh, you know, I, Harmon and I, uh, you know, used to get together and walk the yard and talk about what we needed to do, what we needed to organize again and stuff. But he knew something that was beyond the things, you know, and he asked me and I told him, I said, man, we gotta, we gotta do something about this, you know? We can't, we can't keep, just keep letting these kids come in here and, you know, and, and, you know, and, and, and rape, prison rape is such a part of prison culture that pe many people have lost their lives, their lives, uh, you know, uh, being caught up in it. And so we, Harmony and I talked about this before we decided to bring it to the other members of the prison chapter, you know, uh, we talked about this and we talked about what the possibilities are, what it could lead to. And unfortunately, we did lose a comrade. Uh, his name was Irvin Bro, and he was stabbed at death trying to protect a little kid. Uh, but at the time, you know, the Brent Miller uh, situation had happened and they had locked a, a lot of people up who they knew it was in the chapter and stuff. So he was, for some, you know, some miracle, he was the only one that didn't get locked up. And I tried to get word to him, you know, look, you don't have the kind of support you had and stuff, you know, so you need to lay low, blah, blah, blah. And, but, you know, he wasn't hearing it. And he, the principles of the party that he had committed to was so strong, you know, and he tried to save this little kid and unfortunately he lost his life, you know. And that is a burden that, you know, I care, care with me almost every day. You know? And so, you know, uh, but, you know, uh, I was asked one time, would I change anything about my life? You know, and I'm like, nah, I wouldn't, you know, because everything that I went through, is the reason I'm, I'm, I am the person I am not, you know? Uh, so as difficult as it was, as painful as it was, uh, you know, I wouldn't change a thing, you know? But that's how, that's how, you know, what motivated us to start the anti-rape squad, you know? And, and it worked for a while, you know? I mean, uh, we would go down, and of course, like I say, it was a dangerous situation. So we would arm ourselves and you know, it's called fresh fish day. It's when our prisoners come out of the uh, processing into a prison population. Mm -hmm. And there's a bus that come, you know, and it's a, it's a network where guys who into that kind of thing working in the processing, they would send word down to guys in population to be on the lookout for certain uh, young kids, you know, who they knew was vulnerable. And so what we would do is we would go down to the Sally Port where the bus would come in and when everybody would get out, you know, I mean, when you, you're a convict, you, you, you got experience, you can spot the vulnerable uh, people, you know. And, and so we would go up to them and we would introduce ourselves and we would tell them, what we was about, and we would school them what to look out for, what not to do, you know, and stuff. And if you if you need help, come to us. You know, we'll we we'll, we we'll, we'll give you some kind of protection as much as we can, you know. And uh, we we uh, we a lot of hatred from population people who 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 prospered in this kind of lifestyle, you know. And uh, the security, even security people, you know, because they gave protection to a lot of the time we use as rape artists, you know, they, and they benefited from it and stuff. 
And so we, you know, it was a very volatile and dangerous situation. But again, you know, it was, we felt as though, uh, how, how could we lay our head on a pillow at night, knowing that this was going on and not do anything about it, you know? So that's how, that's how the thing, you know, and that's that look, the looking at that young kid, it still haunts me, you know? It still haunts me. Um, I, I think I have one more question, then we're going to go to the q and I, I wanted to understand a little more about what impact you think you and the, the three of you had on the other prisoners. And I was curious, do you think you had any impact on the guards? Yeah. The, the fact that, you know, in prison, you live, uh, people become certain individuals for personal motive, you know, it, uh, we call it the game, you know, a guy will act a certain way, carry himself a certain way, because his end game is to exploit something or the benefit from it person. I think the examples that we set, the fact that they could not break us, the fact that we uh, never compromise on the principles, uh, the values or whatever that, you know, we live by, I think that impressed them. And it also impressed, uh, you know, some of the prison guards. I mean, I can't tell you how many prison guards, mostly of them African Americans come to us and tell us, man, why don't y'all just, you know, you know y'all just need to just get out of these cells, man. Uh, those guys down the walk, blah, blah. but he, he was seeing it from a prison guard perspective. He wasn't seeing it from a, 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 a revolutionary uh, thing. He, he didn't, you know, uh, we knew that we were making an impact by the mere fact and, 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 and for lack of a better word, the reverence that other prisoners showed us, you know, that we could send word anywhere in the prison from a cell and cause something positive to happen, you know, so that's how we knew, you know, uh, uh, and it also gave us a, uh, uh, the, the strength and the energy to keep going, you know, that we knew what we were doing was right, you know, because of that influence, that, because of that impact, you know. And, and, and real quick, um, in 2008, because of the civil suit we had filed against long-term cell confinement, we had been locked up about 30-something years in cell then. Uh, the warden created what's called a, a, a transitional dawn for anyone in, uh, in, in solitary. You're supposed to go there, stay there, and adjust, and then go back into prison. We knew it was bullshit, excuse my language. They were just trying to weaken our civil suit. But anyhow, the first time I had a contact visit, uh, my brother Michael, who I write about, who was my rock, uh, he came and he brought uh, some of my nieces and nephews with him. But during the visit, guys kept coming to the table, just kept coming to the table, you know? And they just, uh, Mr. Whitbox, I just want you know, come over, shake your hand. Uh, can I get a hug? Uh, is it possible for you to take a picture with me and my family, you know? And uh, so for me, that was the first time that I actually felt the impact of what I was doing the sacrifices I was making and stuff. And so the people, the monitors in the shade, the security guard, they saw this. So they call the administration and like, look, all these guys keep coming up to Wood Fox table, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, about half an hour later, uh, the camp warden and the colonels and all of them came. And I figured like, well, this is gonna intimidate these guys. You know, but it didn't. They just kept coming, kept coming, you know. And when I went back to the dorm, you know, and it, it and I sat on the bed and like Harmon, you know, who knew me so well, him and I was in this fake dorm, you know, he come over and he sat down, he put his arm around me and he said, What's going on? You know. And I'm like, man, you won't believe what happened in the shade, you know, and I'm like, 
all these guys kept coming to the table. You know, want guys asking me to take pictures with their family, and shaking my hand. God asked me, can they get a hug? You know, and so it was like thirty years, about thirty something years. It's like thirty something years of pain and suffering and gassing and beating, going to the dungeon and all that. It's like all of that didn't matter anymore. You know, it didn't matter. You know, so that's how you know I knew. Uh, and Robert and Harmon knew that, you know, we were, we were making a difference uh, in the prison. You know. And some of the policies, I mean, they had to change policies because of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of the uh, protests we were doing, the hunger strikes. And, and, you know, at some point we realized we couldn't physically continue to resist what was going on in the prison. We just couldn't hold up. They were, they were beating us down, you know? And so we said, well, we got to find another way to continue struggling beyond just hunger strikes and stuff. And so there was a guy on the tier, uh, his name was uh, Arthur Mitchell. Uh, they used to call him the writ writer because he used to file a lot of suits against the prison system. So we decided, well, that's what we need to do. We need to start going in the court beyond just physical resistance. We need, you know, we need to, if we can, if we can get these people outside of their system, then they don't have complete control, you know? And, but the thing is, we didn't know nothing about the law, you know? So that means back to the books, you know? It's the same thing we had politically educated ourselves and the history and re-educated ourselves. Now we had to teach ourselves the law, both criminal and, and civil law. And so that was like sometimes 18 hours a day studying law books, reading cases, uh, uh, getting a thing. And, and, and we had a great support for me. There was a lot of guys one of them right now, he is an organization in New Orleans called Vote, Vote, Vote Voices of the Experience, named Norris Ennis, who played a tremendous part because they provided us with material that you couldn't, that wasn't supposed to happen or have in solitary. You know, books, law books, uh, memor uh, copies of cases, stuff like it there. And, you know, uh, there's another guy, he's going to law school now, his name Calvin Duncan. You know, uh, he was one of the top inmate lawyers in the prison. You know, and the list goes on and on. We had, you know, and so that's how you know you're making a difference. When, when other men are always willing to risk their own uh, jobs or their own uh, uh, security status, you know, to help you. Uh, you know, uh, that was the ultimate uh, 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 sign of respect uh, that we felt from prison population. You know? So, I mean, the, the, the heavy lifting was on me, but I had a lot of help. And the same thing with Robert and Harmon, you know. We had a lot, a lot of help, you know. We didn't, although we, we, we uh, was, was the symbol of, of resistance, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, other prisoners, unknown thing, and you know, uh, which is one of the reasons that why I wanted to write solitary. You know, uh, at the time it wasn't solitary; it was uh, my title was born dead, fighting and live. You know, because uh, I believe that African Americans in this country socially we are born dead, and we spend the rest of our lives fighting and live. You know, but uh, after talking with. Uh, uh, you know, my editor and stuff, I decided to change it to solitary. But the that was the original title I had in mind. Mm. Thank you so much, Brother Albert, for your, your words and your experience. Um, Alice, did you have one more question or did you want me to go ahead? It was okay to go to Q&A. Did you have a, fi a final question, Alice? I can ask it later. We can go into the Q&A. I see that there's okay. some good questions. Sure. Okay. So thank you. So we're going to, first of all, thank you so much for your time, your knowledge, your experience, your commitment to us. Even when we didn't know we needed it. We thank you. Uh, so we have a couple of questions in the Q&A and I just wanted to read one at a time and get your thoughts on these questions. So okay. one is from Leslie Alexander. 
And she says, one of the things that always deeply impressed me about the Pampas, especially those who became political prisoners, is the depth of solidarity among them and their commitment to the struggle above all else. What does it require to become a person who was willing to sacrifice anything, including your life, in order to serve the people? With, with me, you know, I, you know, and I was a man with all the other brothers and sisters who joined the party, you know. Uh, you know, you can, you know, uh, uh, and it's not a great thing, but it's like, you know, the old saying, if you beat a dog enough, sooner or later he'll turn, you know, he'll defend himself, you know. And uh, with me, you know, uh, that was the situation, you know, seeing and reading and, 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 and you know, about the constant, the way African-Americans were being treated, the way other minorities were being treated, the way poor whites were being treated, working class people and stuff, you know, it would just, it just, you know, uh, you know, I, I talk about it in the book. Uh, I was in, in, uh, you know, as I escaped and stuff and I got caught in New York, I was in the tombs and the Panther 21 case happened. So four of the members of the Panther 21 was put on a tier with us. The floor I was on, I was on the eighth floor. And the, first of all, the way they come in would just blew my mind, you know. Uh, they didn't come in uh, trying to exploit nobody, take advantage of nobody, run game, as we say, you know, they come in talking about unity and, and community empowerment and stuff, you know, and, and um, you know, economic, uh, political institutional racism and, you know, uh, how we, we as a people have been oppressed and we have been defined by everybody but ourselves, you know. And so, you know, uh, those are the things that, you know, for me, at the, at the time I was listening, but I wasn't hearing what they were saying. And a, and a young brother came now from upstate New York and he was trying to you know, get out of prison. And he had a book called A Different Drum. You know? And he, one night he said, look, yeah, I want you to read this book and tell me what you think. You know? It was the first book I'd ever read from cover to cover, nonstop, you know? And I didn't realize it at the time, but the next day when I went out and the Panther, they used to have a meeting every day for about an hour or so. And all of a sudden I wasn't just listening, I was hearing what they were saying. And the dots started to connect, you know? So I don't know if that's an individual thing or if it just if it with me, but I, I I I would take a leap of faith and say that's that's what it is. That when someone uh you know in life I firmly believe that an individual or an event raises your level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Once your level of consciousness is raised, you can never go back. You know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happened to me. I think it's what happened to every man, woman and child who dedicated their life to the Black Panther Party. The party raised their level of conscience to a point where they can no longer live with themselves if they accepted the way things were. Mm. Thank you. We have another question from uh, Mario Venegas, uh, who says that, uh, Brother Albert, solidarity is torture. I'm sorry, sorry solitary is torture. Uh, <laughs> how have you faced the trauma that it caused. Um, is it like a disease that has no cure? Can you can you talk about this? You are great. Yeah, I mean, I you know, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. I still, you know, I haven't had one in a, a long time, but I, you know, I still get claustrophobic attacks. Mm -hmm. And uh, a new development was sometime I wake up and I'm not aware of where I'm at. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and it, uh, you know, you, you, the one thing you lose is a sense of time. 
to me, it didn't, it don't seem that long before I snap and I'm like, oh, you're in the bedroom. Or, oh, you're on a sofa, you know? Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, those are, those are part of the, you know, things I still go to. Uh, one thing that I learned uh, that you don't have to be in a nine, a nine by six cell to have claustrophobic attack, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, Unfortunately, you know, I've been a, become a very big part of my family. And we were at a swimming event for some of my great niece and nephews. And, you know, when claustrophobia hits, you, it's, it's like the very air itself starts to pressure down on you. So, and we were sitting in an auditorium with, you know, swimming pools, four or five swimming pools, four or five hundred people. And we're sitting there and I'm with my niece. And, and, and great niece and nephew and stuff. And all of a sudden, you know, it's like I could feel this pressure on me, you know, and, and I realized what it was, you know. So, you know, I just told my brother, I said, well, I got to go to the bathroom. You know? mm-hmm. And so I left and I went outside. And I just was, you know, pacing has always been a relief for me. And so I was just pacing around and around the parking lot. You know? And I don't know how long it was. Uh, but he, eventually he come out, you know, and he come out right where it was beginning to, you know, expand the air, the pressure, uh, everything was going back in place. And he's like, uh, you okay? You know, I said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm all right, you know. He's like, no, what's going on, you know? And I'm like, you know, well, my brother Michael, you know, he's my rock, you know, and I'm like, I don't know, man. I had I had a claustrophobic attack, and I, I, I don't understand how. You know, I'm not in the cell, I'm not at house in the bedroom or nothing. I'm sitting in all the room with all these people. You know, so you know, uh, being you know the kind of person I am now. Of course, I did some some research uh, when I got back. You know, and I realized that you know claustrophobic attacks can happen no matter where you're at. You know, but it was the first time it had ever happened to me. I guess because of the first time I had ever been free physically and, 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 you know, in that kind of uh, thing, you know, but yeah, those, those, are those are the things that I deal with now. Claustrophobic sack, which I haven't had one, I don't know, in about two or three months now. And, uh, but a couple of weeks, about two weeks ago, I woke up and I was like confused as to where I was. Hmm. And, uh, it didn't seem to last that long. And I'm like, oh, you're in the bedroom, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I, I don't let it, you know, uh, deter me. I don't, I don't let it, you know. It don't have a great psychological effect on me, uh, you know, because when you've deal dealt with this for, you know, forty uh, four years and ten months, you know, it's kind of like, oh, hey, old friend, how you doing, you know? <laughs> and and so that's kind of attitude I have to take take about it when it do happen, you know. Mm. But, uh, you know, uh, it's hard to put into words something inside of you uh, as to why you, you know, and I've seen uh, a lot of men commit, you know, acts of violence on themselves and other men. I've seen men stoop to the lower throwing human waste on each other Mm. uh, because that's what solitary does to you. When you can find an individual to a nine by six cell with a much smaller space, it robs that individual. If he does not have a level of consciousness, it robs that individual of his human dignity. It robs him of his sense of who self worth of self respect. You know, it reduces him to the lowest level possible. You know, and so part of the thing that Robert and Harmon and I did was the fight against us, to try to instill in these guys that live around us a sense of self-worth. You know, Rob, one of Robert's first, uh, favorite saying was like, you in prison, prison is not in you. Mm-hmm. Don't let this prison destroy you. Don't let what these people do destroy you, you know? If you want to learn, I will help you. I will teach you, you know? And that was, you know, uh, you know, uh, We've taught, we taught men how to read and write. We taught men about history, geography, you know, but in order to be able to be a teacher, you had to know. 
So that in turn motivated us, you know. Uh, like I say, I, you know, I don't read as much as I used to, but I became an avaricious reader. You know, I was reading at one time, I was reading like 12, 15 books a week, you know. Mm. I even sent off and got a book and learned how to speed read, you know. So, because I couldn't consume, you know, when I was reading fast enough, you know. And uh, so, you know, uh, you know, it, it was a two way street, you know. But as far as how, how we kept going, thankfully, the oppression of the state and the prison systems gave us more than enough to struggle with every day, you know. So we, it was never was like it was a smooth transition. You know, we something would pop up and we would find a way to solve it. And then, you know, maybe a day or two later, something else. And it was always because the, the administration or security people were, you know, changing rules or policies or regulations or whatever. You know, and so uh, that's pretty much how I, uh, you know, continue to move forward and, and, and not just survive solitary, but to prosper as a human being. Mm. You know, mm. you know uh, cause and effect, as they say, you know, I mean, I could have, you know, uh, and, and there are times when I ask myself, you know, why, why me, you know, uh, you know, why, I, you know, I could have easily been broken like other men. I could have easily uh, turned in with, to the prison culture, you know, and, and but I did, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, I, you know, in, in my world, the ancestors, the African American or the African ancestors are always looking over our shoulders, always guiding us, you know. Mm -hmm. And so in my world, you know, the ancestors, you know, always gave me the guidance at the right time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, Martha Dwyer asked a, simple, a basic question, straightforward. Could you just repeat what was the original title of solitary that you wanted to have? What was the original title? Oh, uh, in, in Angola, every prison state has a different name, but in, in Angola, it was CCR, closed cell restrictions. Mm -hmm. And solitary, you stay in a cell, a nine by six cell, 24 hours out of a uh, 23 hours out of 24 hour period. You get one hour every 24 hours out the cell. Mm -hmm. And at one time, uh, we didn't get to go outside, mm -hmm. but because of, uh, you know, hunger strikes and challenges in the court, uh, we forced them to give us outside exercise three days uh, a week. Okay. And so I'm hour. sorry. I'm sorry. What was the, was there a different title for the book? Solitary? Was there, did you? Well, when I wrote the book and my reason for writing the book is like, man, I got to let people know what's going on here. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think people know what's in, and as, uh, as Margaret said earlier, a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, uh, don't still on know what about solitary and what's, what's, what's done in the name of, in their name, mm -hmm. you know, in prison. So, uh, but my original thing uh, was, uh, Born dead, fighting to live, mm. and that came from uh, I seen a they had a, a uprising, I think in California or something, mm. and, uh, uh, and 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 so the anger, uh, you know, I mean, you know, they always talk about they find up their own neighborhood, yeah, because you called North White neighborhood. I'm sure they would have liked them went downtown, the main, you know, uh, uh, shopping center. And and, 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 and and act out that frustration, you know? But they confine them. I mean, that's what they do whenever they create these, these uh, and things, then they confine, they surround the, uh, the, the African-American community with tanks and all these other war uh, materials they have now, you know, and, and, and because they know that, that anger and frustration is gonna spin itself out after a certain amount of time, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, 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 you know, that's, that's just, you know, it's the way life is right now. It shouldn't be that way, but that's the way it is. And uh, as frustrated as I get sometimes, uh, I never, I never stop believing that I can make a difference. I just have to s survive to the next day, mm. you know, and not lose hope, you know. Well, speaking of today, in today's times, 
a key word that's come across the political spectrum, especially in our world, is the term abolition. And but it's become vexed where some people on one side are saying, if you can't fully transform and destroy the infrastructure of today, then it's not abolition. Then other folks that say, well, it's, it's more it's more complicated than that. If you are freeing yourself from your current conditions, that is the expression of abolition. Well, this whole salon and this whole campaign that we're putting forward is a part of a larger abolition campaign. So we wanted to ask you and everyone that comes through the salon, what is your vision of abolition? Well, I've, I've did a lot of uh, work with uh, abolitionist movements. So I've been involved in uh, uh, the conversations, you know, and, and the debates and stuff. And I think we as an active activist force in this country have did a poor job of explaining what abolition, abolition mean to me. You know, most people when they hear the word abolition, they do away with, mm -hmm. you know? So I've asked the questions many times, okay, if we abolish prisons, then what do, what do we do when the revolution come or when society is changed and what do we do with the real criminals, you know? Do we take them out and dig a big ditch and shoot them in the head? You know, to me, so to me, abolition means changing prison as it is and make prisons geared toward uh, rehabilitation or preparing people who have made mistakes to come back into society and be productive members, you know? Not to lock a man up. I mean, man, come on, they got guys in there go to right now. Been there 30, 40, 50 years for a bag of dope. Mm. You know, because of the Louisiana was the first state uh, to enact what's called a HBC, habitual felony crime. So if you're convicted of two and more felonies, they give you life. So you got dudes, you know, and it's, it's all over the country now, but you know, in Angola, you got dudes, man, have been in prison for 40, 50 years for a five dollar bag of dope. And they wasn't they wasn't criminals. They were just a dope fiends. They got addicted to dope, you know. That society forced in the black community as a means of control. Mm -hmm. These guys didn't wasn't rivals or burglars or, or nothing. They were just addicted to drugs. But they've been in and and they are some of the most model prisons in in the United States. But they can't get out because, you know, the corruption of the judicial system in this country, the, the, the institutional racism that's involved in from the police out to the DA to the to the to the judicial system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You got got look, me, Harmon, and Robert, we went 20 years without a disciplinary report. And it didn't mean nothing. Every time we went before, it's called a reclass board. Every 90 days you go before the reclass board and they determine if they're gonna let you out of solitary. You know? Mm. Now you can't get no better than that. 20 years without a disciplinary folk, <laughs> you know? And it didn't mean nothing. It didn't count for nothing. And we knew this, mm. you know? So we never went in there hoping that, well, they, you know, I got, 15 years without a write-up. That's what they call disciplinary court, write-ups. I got 15 years without a write-up. I know I'm getting out the day, you know. We went in there knowing it was going to be the same old thing, you know. Mm. Physically dangerous to himself and others, you know. Mm. That's, the That's what they would always put on our, our slip. Mm -hmm. Dang, physically dangerous to himself and others, you know. So, I mean, that's, you know, and that's the kind of thing you know, we, uh, Robert and I, you know, uh, now that this pandemic is beginning to, uh, uh, you know, get under control or whatever, you know. Uh, so I begin to start doing a little traveling. Uh, since the end of the pandemic, you know, I've been to uh, Destin, Florida. Uh, the uh, Mar uh, Louisiana Bar Association asked me to come there and speak about uh, you know, uh, my views on the judicial system. And uh, a couple of months ago, I was in uh, Topeka, Kansas at Washburn University. And, uh, you know, the uh, uh, student body doing uh, work on my book 
and they asked me to come and so I, that was an honor and uh and uh, next month i'll be going to minneapolis uh, uh to uh the uh legal revolutionary program is starting there to help prisoners learn the law and uh and you know some of them uh, go to law school and stuff like it there mm -hmm. so you know the fact that we taught ourselves the law and stuff we've been i've been asked to come out there and uh and you know do what we're doing i talk about it and hopefully inspire people uh, and show them that if you stand if you don't break mm. you can you know make it you know all right well on on that note we want to thank you so much i could talk to you for another hour maybe two but that's our time we want to honor people's time i want to thank you i want to thank alice kim I want to thank Margaret Power for being in conversation with you. I also want to thank uh, uh, our co-founder of SSJ, Barbara Ransby, for being here and uh, throwing love to Leith Mullings, rest in peace, rest in power. Also want to thank Mia Silver for behind the scenes, keeping all this together so it wouldn't fall apart. And so <laughs> and I want to thank everyone in the virtual world for being here with us in this evening, this afternoon, for bearing witness to your, to your knowledge, your wisdom, your experience, your legacy. Brother Albert, so we just want to thank you so much on behalf of Historians for Peace and Democracy and for Scholars for Social Justice. We want to thank you. We also want to say that if you want to learn more about what we are doing at SSJ um, and want to perhaps get on the list for a newsletter, there will be a link in the chat right now. So don't leave yet. I know some of y'all trying to leave. Don't leave yet. There's a link in the chat. Please sign up to find out more about what we're up to at SSJ as we move forward with our uh, ARIS project of abolition, reparations, investment, uh, and security as a, a, a multi-year long project. And this, we are honored to have Brother Albert Wilfox as kicking it off for our Leaf Mullings Social Justice Salon. We could have started it no better way than have him here. And so just well, thank- I'm so honored, you know. Just thank everybody for being here tonight, today. And we move forward with your words of resilience, of courage, and moral strength. So thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank we you. Appreciate you. All right. Peace. Peace. Yes.